Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School teaches product management, coding, data analytics, digital marketing, UX design, and product leadership courses online and are 16 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joe Kendall. I am a product manager on Retail Me Not's labs team um, where our intent and really my job is to look around and see the future of shopping and the future of sort of retail around it. So this is, I didn't really start out as a product manager. Uh, I started out in research and worked in both consumer electronics and then started developing products all the way from consumer electronics through industrial equipment and even into now web-based software, both enterprise and uh, B2C. So one of the things I've found in everything that I've worked on is that there's always a starting point, right? And people come to you, especially when you work in the innovation groups, and everyone has an idea, right? They all have something that they really wanna work on or where, oh, I've got this great idea, or hey, we've got these parts, let's, let's put them together and make something new. Or even better, hey, I see this opportunity nobody else is looking at. And the big thing that I found whenever people bring these up is always there's one question to ask that really sort of evaluates whether or not both they've thought about it, but also it makes whatever idea they have, whatever concept or opportunity they found, it makes it better. And it's a really simple question to ask because it's just, what does your product do? What, what is your idea? Now, this sounds like a really simple question, and it is, but answering it is difficult because to answer it well, if you ask most people, they'll give you a paragraph or some people will give you a business plan of 30 pages. If you answer it like that, you don't actually have an answer because your answer needs to be one sentence. You need to be able to answer this question in one sentence, and that sentence needs to also include who it's for. You can't just say, oh, my product solves world hunger. Doesn't really help. Or even, you know, my product makes it easier for developers to debug faster, right? That gets closer. But you really have to say what core value it provides because debugging faster could be great, but not if it doesn't save them time. Because the whole point is you need to know who you're helping and what value you're giving them. And it needs to be clear enough that you can answer it in one sentence. Now, it sounds really simple. It sounds like it could work really well, I hope, but I've found it does. And the reason it works is because it forces you to focus and it aligns stakeholders and collaborators. It also makes it so everyone can make decisions. You have to focus because if you answer it in one sentence, you can't lose focus. You have to get down to the condensed value that you're providing and who it is. It aligns the stakeholders because that one sentence is easier to share. It's easy to talk through. It's easy to say, this is what we're doing. This is what it does. And if you can't answer it in that one sentence, or even if you've never thought to answer it, it's there. Now, it's different from a value proposition. It's different from a mission statement because this is telling you who gets value from it and what it does. And if you can get it down into one sentence, then you know what you're focused on. You can make decisions and everyone else can as well. You can all move faster because you're focused, you're aligned, and you're actually working together. Now this is a really good idea. It's a lot of fun if I just talk to you and say that. So rather than just give you this quick sentence, I'm gonna try giving you some examples from my own experience of how I've been able to use this to make this work better. So to start with, one product I worked on um, while I was at IBM, I was leading a tool called Provider Workbench. Now Provider Workbench was a really interesting program because it was homegrown within IBM. It had spun up from sort of the startup model of a really small team looking for a problem, actually going out through user research to get started and run through it. But when I was there and right before I showed up, I was able to watch and everyone 
was churning. They kept having this different challenge where each executive was trying to direct it in its own way or pull it in another way. And so one of the very first things I did when I got there was just talk to the team. I asked every single person on the team what Provider Workbench did. And the really interesting thing was they all had a various levels of conversations and everything else. No one could explain it simply, but they all wanted to do the same thing, which was not what the executives were looking for them to do. So when we got together as a team, we could go through and we could talk through it. And we just came up with this simple sentence of provider workbench guides software release teams to the confusion of onboarding into IBM's many systems. Now this was something our whole team worked out together because they'd been working on it for so long, but it wasn't clear exactly what it was that they were trying to do. They had a mission of let's make it easy, streamlined. We have this user value that we really want to provide, but it wasn't clear to everyone else what that was and it kept getting messed up. So once we had this sentence, it became so easy and my job became very clearly around just conveying this point, the confusion of onboarding into IBM's many systems. You know, at the time, there were so many, this is just some of them, different ways that you could get in and different tools you had to use to get into IBM. And this was both for third parties and for teams within IBM. So everyone sort of knew this problem, but no one was living it. And so rather, or no, none of our executives had actually lived it. But just having this one sentence made it so clear of like, oh, this is, this is the pain point. And that's actually when I pulled together all these screenshots to be able to say like, hey, exec team, this is what the problem is. All of these are ways to get into it. All of these are different tools, all of these different ways around it. And so being able to run through it was really valuable to be able to say, this is the different systems that we have. Once they were able to see just even this many windows and this many starting points, we no longer had to argue that this was the key pain and the value that we were trying to solve. And we were able to actually run and start addressing this. Another one was it was about guiding. The team was all really clearly focused on guiding and the problem was around so much confusion. So how do we guide them through? And it was a user value question and a user experience of being able to say, well, let's just do tasks. So it became a UX platform and UX sort of paradigm that we were following to be able to say, you have these tasks that you need to do that are just guiding and we're gonna tell you what's required and what's optional and help you through with everything embedded within the space. What it meant was that you didn't have to leave, you didn't have to consolidate a bunch of different places because it was about guiding. We wouldn't do anything for you, but we would collect the information because that's what a guide would do. And then we also realized this was a tool for teams, right? No individual was actually doing all this work themselves. So from the beginning, we made sure that we were able to communicate it and each one of these priorities, both with our, within our team and external to our team, we could then focus and it was like, okay, we need to make sure that we have these different software release teams and have talked to them and understand what it is, which meant we built very strong and very early on just user controls. You could invite people, you could have different levels of permissions. All of that was built into this. So rather than focused on integration with external systems, we were being able to focus on these are the things so that it will be useful as a tool to guide people. Now, as we built this, one of the things we realized was that our sentence was actually not quite right. So while we had said it, we actually went through and realized it needed to be a single interface because our first attempt actually was just sort of a, a wiki. It was just a way to go through and guide stuff. And we realized that it had to be a single interface because then you could actually do all this. And that single interface is really what provided the value and let us focus on it. So being able to send, put the sentence together, the team could really run with it because they understood what it was and they had started with it. But also by asking, we took what was an amorphous idea and a pain point and a set of consolidated problems that everyone had a different take on and were able to pull it all together into one focused thing that our sponsorship and our leadership could actually understand and communicate and value so that not only could we make the features that we need to make, but we could actually make everything else work. Now, you know, that was Provider Workbench and it was software. I mentioned I worked in both industrial and consumer hardware. And this was a really interesting problem where I came into a prototype that had been built where they said, hey, we have this new unit. It's gonna be called the Zuni. We wanna launch it. Now this is an electrolytic disinfectant generator, which 
is a long way to say it takes water and salt and electricity and it makes bleach that you use to disinfect water for pools for water treatment or cooling towers so there's a lot of industrial applications for it and it's a pretty interesting technology but it was a new one that not everyone had seen and more than that it was used primarily in industrial applications so a larger version of this technology is used to disinfect the water in this for 22 million people in Bogota, Colombia. So this was something which you can hopefully tell is about the size of a water heater. It's a small unit that is really one to run well. So when they had this prototype, easy question to ask was, what does it do? And usually people would say, well, it's a disinfectant generator. It does electrolysis. You put in water, salt, and electricity, and it makes bleach. But that's the answer for a lot of things. The real question was, who was it for? What was the real value it did? And so in working through this, this was just one where I was asking myself, what does it do? Right? What is this problem? Who is it for? What's the value it provides? Let, let's bring it down into one thing. And so it became very quickly giving small non-technical operators instant access to effective disinfectant without having to spend time on support or maintenance. Now, everyone else would say, would focus on this instant access to effective disinfectant, and that's what it does. But the really interesting part is who and what value it provided. So the whole point being small, you know, this could sit on your tabletop, it's about the size of a bread box, or it could have this whole tank within it, which was an integrated running tank. Now, that may not mean anything, but what's most interesting from it was that once it got small, it meant it could fit actually in things like pools. So who you had was these non-technical operators. Industrial equipment, you usually have t trained technicians, they know how to run it, they know how to read manuals and run through it. Non-technical operators, this is small. It's going into pools, like your community pool. You probably are gonna have the same guy who's checking the chlorine levels who needs to scoop up some water and drop in a packet, run this. But they're never gonna read a manual. And also, if you have your high school sophomore who's your lifeguard doing the rest of it, it needs to be very easy to use. When we showed up, there was a binder with a manual that shipped with every single one of these. And rather than giving them a manual who most people don't read, especially if you're a non-technical operator, we just made this simple sheet, right? So I went out and I said, here, I'm going to collect all this information. I'm going to put it together into one quick start guide. And this became the first thing that showed up when you opened the box. So when you ordered one of these, now you could see it. And it felt, rather than industrial, much more like a consumer technology. And the reason for it is these non-technical operators weren't gonna do there. Now, another thing that went into these non-technical operators were these LED indicators. And you can't see until the later part, but there's just one LED light with a little screen on the front. And so we just made simple indicators to say, this is what each one of these lights means. So you can walk by and understand. And this quick reference and these simple LED indicators made it so that you didn't need any sort of degree. We simply labeled everything. We made it very easy so that you didn't have to have any technical background or understand even what a disinfectant generator or electrolysis was. You could simply look at this and say, it's working or it's not or what's going on. Now for the instant access, this is sort of the core of what the technology provided, but the way you got there was still sort of, could be overly technical or could be confusing, especially when you haven't seen something like this before and it's different from what you know. So we made it so there were only these three ports coming out of the back of it. You had water, salt, and then the oxygen that you needed. We have electricity that you just plugged in and there was a switch. You plug that in and it worked. So it meant it was quick, it was easy, and you didn't have to chase everything down all the time. And this was really the key part of it. You know, non-technical operators, you don't wanna spend time on support and maintenance. So when we looked at a product, and I was looking at this and we said, okay, we have the first version of the prototype, what's the production unit? And we went through and we said, great, I'm gonna go find marketing. And we're going to build just simple YouTube videos that explain what it does and how it works, because you can see people actually watch them. You send these out, it's a piece of industrial equipment, but it, it's still also just something that you can access 
and something you can work through so that you don't have to worry about support and maintenance. And it's built so that it doesn't have to be getting support and maintenance, but also the different sort of nesting about so that when you need to work on it, if you do, you can get access to different parts easily and you can watch videos to help support through it so that you don't have to spend the time on this. You just set it and forget it and let it go and it will automate the process. And when it does have any issues, it informs you, you can check it easily and there's support out there to make it work. So what we were able to do was take something that was, uh, had a core idea that was really valuable, you know, get more people into it, make this work better and turn it into something that actually hit who the targeted audience was when it was sort of missing parts of it beforehand. So last example is one much closer to me now, which is Retail Me Not's Genie application, which is a web browser extension that actually checks our coupon codes and helps save you money and save the deals for you. If you've used Honey, it's very similar to that. So showing up, a really big question is, you know, what does Genie do? Now this was a really interesting challenge because it was mostly developed, right? We knew what we were gonna build, we'd started working through it, but when we go through and we actually define what we're trying to do, you know, it's helping online shoppers save time and money by automatically finding you the best way to save. So you shop like you normally do, it goes in and it saves you the time and hassle of looking for things and just does all the work for you. Sounds pretty good. But even in that sentence, you know, in an innovation group, one of the things that we do is we tend to go off on tangents and being able to define this question, help the entire team focus away from point of sale systems, right? We could have checked it out, we looked at it, but if it's just online shoppers, we don't need to worry about the full point of sale. We don't need to worry about these parts that work within it, which will dramatically complicate the situation. And when you look at it, being able to focus and keep that focus is a huge value to speed and delivery. When we say it's about automatically finding you the best way to save, it does the work for you, which would seem pretty obvious, but what it means is that we could focus on the automation and personalization. So there's newer and deeper technology that's enabling it to make it work for you. It's not just the sense of we're gonna automatically check everything. We're gonna make it and apply it to what you wanna do, which again would able to focus us so that we could look at the right time in a user's journey to really be effective. So when you show up at checkout, it shows up great. We'll do all the work for you at that point. We're not gonna bother you beforehand. But the other thing that it really enabled was seeing where we wanted to go. So when you're asking this question, a really good point to bring up is, you know, it's not just about asking who, it's also asking everyone. You ask yourself and you ask other people, what does your product do? When you ask that and try and answer it in one sentence, it'll actually just drive a greater conversation. You also want to revisit your answer, like in Provider Workbench. We originally had one, we realized it was wrong. This is not a fixed thing. It's a point in time and it's one that you want to do where everyone can align on it. Because when you revisit your answer, you then get to further refine and further focus and align and make sure you're solving the problem and providing the value you want. And a way to revisit it is to just post it somewhere obvious, right? Stick it up. I write it very big on a wall usually because we have whiteboards and big whiteboard walls are great. And let everyone look at it. Everyone should know, and this isn't something that the product manager owns, this is your entire team. Everyone answers this question, everyone can work through it. Because when you post it somewhere obvious, you can all work better through it. So at the end, if you've done this well, and if you've actually come up with a good answer that tells who it's for, what value it provides in one sentence, then what you're really gonna end up with is a map you know which direction you're headed. You've got a map and where your team wants to go so everyone can work towards that. That's really all we're trying to do as product managers is make our teams work better and empower everyone to run as fast as they can to deliver the best thing possible. So this map is really in service of your team and you're just helping your whole team find it. So again, if you're stuck, if you don't know what it is, I'm gonna challenge each one of you to ask yourself, what does your product do? Thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed it.